bit all okay. the way here. <laughs> okay. Some of you already know me, and those who don't, you might know my mom and dad. I'm Susan Reem Wilson, and uh, my mom and daddy were uh, Jeanette Reem, who had the Tubbell L Style Shop, and my dad was Tom Reem, who taught shop here, and Zoe. So uh, I get uh, I get my color sense and things from my mama, and I get my joy of building stuff and figuring out when nobody else knows how to do it from my daddy. So. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's my you where to go. <laughs> yeah. It's telling how, me how to get to my dad's house. Like I've never, like I didn't grow up there. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so I grew up here and graduated from Clearwater R one. Um, it was funny because mom gave me that. Well, I had a couple of these stands and I use them uh, if I'm having shows that are inside. Outside, it'll get blown over. But mama said there are two of these, and she said. Well, if you put them in a garage sale, I think you ought to ask for a little bit more money because I think it's solid brass. Mm -hmm. said it came from Bunyard's and Sons store, but this came from my great-grandparents' store. Oh, yeah. I was taught to uh, be respectful to my elders when my mom was screaming, hello, freeze over before I put that in a stupid garage sale. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, okay, mama, that's good to know. Wow. Now, Bunyard's and Sons store was where the dentist office is now. And before that, it was Harris's store. And I don't know how many years before that, it was Bunyard and Sons. Millard Harris. What? Millard Harris. Millard Harris, yes. Dad called him Sleepy Harris. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, uh, it was Bunyard and Sons. And my uh, grandpa Lacey was one of the sons. And uh, so I have three generations of retailing behind me. So I guess that's kind of why I do this. Um, I went to, uh, these are my notes to, uh, to, what was I talking, okay. When I was on vacation with mom and dad, we were in the Great Smoky Mountains, and we went to this place called Cades Cove, and there was a mill there, and there was a lady spinning on a spinning wheel, and she was explaining about the mill and everything. I thought, oh, wow, this has got to be the coolest job ever, but I can't make a living at that. And I don't know how to do anything special. And, uh, well, I was right about you can't make a living at it. But I learned how to do something special. And uh, decades and decades later, my husband was in charge of Dillard Mill. And for giggles and grins, Dillard Mill State Park, nearby Burnham. And for giggles and grins, I take my spinning wheel and go down there and sit on the front porch and spin and talk to the people and tell them about the mill. So, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, I went to SEMO, got a, uh, got a degree in computer science, which of course that read, led right into being a finger weaver. I haven't figured that one part out. And I also minored in anthropology and uh, management. <coughs> so I, uh, that job took me to C to uh, St. Louis and, uh, they had a uh, volunteer telethon on one of the TV stations. And getting people to, instead of getting people to pledge money, they asked them to pledge volunteer hours. So, okay. And the uh, City Corp wanted to give a, um, a corporate donation, a corporate pledge. So they asked a bunch of the employees who wanted to, to sign up to volunteer hours. Okay. And there's a whole list of places you could go, and one of them was Cahokia Mounds. It's like, wow, we went there on once from a field trip from college. Like, gee, I don't know if they'd, I just have a mere bachelor, I mean, I have a minor in it, in anthropology. I don't know if they'd really take me as a volunteer. I started volunteering there in 88, and uh, I found out real quick that there, that it was very strict uh, to get in. Do you have a pulse? Are there any outstanding arrest warrants? <laughs> okay, you're in. <laughs> so, um, if you don't know what Cahokia Mounds is, it is the largest Indian city that has ever been. It's just uh, six miles east of St. Louis, near Collinsville, Illinois. And you think about going to South America uh, to see the big pyramids and things like that. You can go to St. Louis and hang a right. Go right across the river. The largest mound. Now, a lot of the mounds have been destroyed because 
as somebody who volunteered there for a long time said that when she was growing up the uh, around Collinsville the general <laughs> thought was if you ain't if you can't grow corn on it what good is it but there were over 100 mounds there the largest one still there it's monk's mound it's 100 feet tall and covers 14 acres at the base it was all done by indians carrying it's called basket loading which means they had backpacks full of dirt they climb the mound dump them that uh, mound was built in stages over a period of years and uh, it's a very impressive thing i encourage everybody to go uh all right you want to wait a while they're having uh, they're renovating the museum the building is about 30 years old and one of the ceilings started falling in Cordy construction at its finest so they're having to replace the roof and put a new hvac system in because they never could control the humidity so one of the maintenance guys told me there was a, a mannequin of an old chief laid out i mean just a, it's just a, a plaster mannequin but it had a case over it is <coughs> uh kind of signifying a body that they found in excavation so they had the old she, chief laid out there and the maintenance told me that every so often they'd have to get the case off of it and scrape the mold off to, oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're they're repairing the H, they're fixing the hvac system to hopefully how it should be We'll see what happens. <laughs> when you get a chance, I go over there. And there's no admission charge for the mounds. They're just there and you can go see them. There's also um, a thing called wood hinge. It's like uh, stone hinge in uh, England. But this is made out of wood posts. And they found the post molds. All right, when you pull a post out of the ground, fence post or whatever, the dirt that fills in the hole is a slightly different color than the dirt surrounding it. So they'd find those, and they found some in an ark, this archaeologist from, uh, not Northwestern, Wisconsin somewhere, said, these seem to be in an ark. So he went over here, and here's another one. Here's a now they weren't sure what to call these, they called them bathtubs, because these holes were elliptical with a uh, one end deeper than the other. They finally figured out, they found a piece of a post in there. They're insertion ramps. You're, okay, you don't have heavy equipment. You don't have any beasts of burden. You don't have any farm animals. So you got this big pole. You drag it over to this hole and then pull it up with the ropes. And, well, it slides down the ramp and sticks in the socket. And you pack the dirt around it. So these posts were all, um, they were a solar observatory and they marked the equinoxes and the solstices because these folks were farmers. This was an important thing for them to know. So it's, a, it's an interesting place over there. And uh, let's see. Okay. I started to... Um, yeah, I started volunteering there. And then in 89, I took a finger weaving course. So I've been there a year. And, uh, oh, also, I didn't know that, but when I uh, volunteered for a thing called Rediscover Cahokia, which was their big event of the year, they, uh, I met a guy who seemed nice enough, but I didn't know he'd changed my life forever later. Mm -hmm. um, so the next year, I learned how to finger weave, and they taught all kinds of classes over there at that time, and I took them, because I've been interested in Indian stuff as long as I can remember. So I took the finger weaving course, and learned to finger weave. <clears throat> Don't know me later saying, you know, when I was a kid, mom and dad took me to this place in Cherokee, North Carolina called O'Connell Lofty Indian Village. And these, these women doing some, they were kind of creating fabric out of nothing. They just had yarn and stuff there and they were just wiggling their fingers and they were weaving fabric. That was what I saw. So um, I started, uh, making um, sashes and wrong ba basket. It was because I had pe friends who were reenactors of the uh, fur trade. And the mark of a mountain man was to have a sash type belt that they could 
square. It was finger woven. And legging ties. Now leggings, forget the stuff that people were in during COVID and go out and in public with and all that stuff. What the leggings were to it was to prepare to protect your legs. Now the Indians wore breech claws, but they didn't have any pant legs, so the long leggings were just think about a pant leg cut off. They do that to wrap uh, leather around their leg, tie it to their sash. Well, to anchor things, I got this on Good Word from Jerry, my husband, uh, that you tie them right below your knees and it, it, it anchors them, keeps them from flopping around. Now, the women wore short leggings. And, okay, this is before they had uh, uh, elastic. So, the short leggings... I didn't bring mine because I didn't want to. <laughs> the, uh, they come up to about here, and I tie them with the legging ties. And so it keeps my socks up. It keeps my leggings up. And that's just to protect your legs. And I gotta back up a little bit. When I first started volunteering at Cahokia, I was uh, a mama who lived in Kirkwood, had a uh, Two-year-old little girl, or year old Sarah was born in 1988, Sarah. And then after a while, my uh, husband decided he liked his girlfriend better. And uh, this guy that was giving me all sorts of uh, information about the leggings and the sashes and how the reenactors wore them because he was one too. Well, he is a guy named Jerry Wilson. And I should have known to stay away from him because... He was a high school teacher. You know how bad those people are. <laughs> he was a high school librarian over in Sparta. And we dated for several years. And uh, I always, I teased him, I said, the reason he really married me was because we do real deer hunting over here. That man lived a deer hunt. Because he said something in the spring. He said, well, I better send in my application for my deer tag. I said, huh? He said, well, in Illinois, you have to send an application in in the spring. It may be different now, but at that time, you sent an application in the spring and hoped that you could get a deer tag in the fall. I said, over here, I think people just go to the uh, local, local liquor store or places that are selling licenses or Walmart, buy a deer tag. And he said, okay, and then he said something... Over there, they had to hunt with shotguns or slug guns. Well, somebody explained it to me later is because Illinois is so much of it's flat, you can't, you want something that doesn't travel far, like a rifle bullet. Because I said, over here, we use deer rifles. So I was teasing him. I said, I think he, uh, I really think that uh, he married me just because there's better deer hunting over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, another thing I make is... Uh, Okay, here's another sash I made for myself. Now, these were all dyed in legging ties. These are all dyed with natural plant dyes. They, uh, this is cochineal, and then that's uh, indigo sulfate. I don't remember what that was dyed with, but these are all plant dyes. And uh, it was, uh, they're fun to make. I had a good time with them. But I decided I wanted to wear it, make other things. And also, I said, Jerry changed my life because, to the better because he became my, well, we got married. And then he became my dye expert. He learned how to do that. Before that, he got me, I volunteered at the museum, but he introduced me to when different museums are having their whatever festival, they will actually pay people to come there and demonstrate. I was like, oh, let me get this straight. I'm gonna sit on my rear end under a tree and do what I love to do anyway, and they're gonna pay me for this? What's the catch? There isn't any. Except there's no climate control. You had to deal with whatever the weather was. But uh, what Jerry did, besides uh, make bone tools, some covered up here. Um, 
he would he carved shell. The Mississippian culture, the people at Cahokia Mounds, would trade with folks on the Gulf Coast to get marine shell. See, this stuff doesn't flake like uh, mussel shell does. So it's marine shell. This stuff is very hard. Prehistorically, they would uh, use uh, flint and a little grit on it and rub, 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 rub to get their designs in it. <coughs> and to, uh, well, to even carve the disc out, they'd drill a bunch of little tiny holes and then pop it out. Because Jerry said, he did a time or two with the flint, but he said, I want to make more than one in my lifetime. So he got a Dremel tool. If he got hardened steel bits, the shell would eat up the steel in about a inch of carving. It was that hard. He had to get diamond-tipped dental bits from his dentist to carve these things with. And this one, too. And they, these are copies of original pieces. The uh, Indians, what they would do is, um, to purify themselves, they would uh, sit in a sweat lodge to sweat and purify their outsides, and they drink, drink something called the black drink. And this is a black drink, ceremonial black drink crop that they make the black drink from. Now, the black drink is yopon holly, which is the only indigenous plant that has caffeine. So if you think about it, if you've ever, now in our society, we're always eating, unless you're Mormon, we're eating chocolate, we're having iced tea, we're having sweet tea, we're having coffee, we're having all this stuff with caffeine in it. Well, they didn't. The only thing that has a black drink. And if you think about it, yourself, if you've uh, maybe been sick for a while and been on water or liquids and been away from the coffee or have your usual morning cup of joe or something, that's it, your stomach like a ton of bricks, doesn't it? Or you feel it. It's, well, see, they didn't have caffeine, so they drink the black drink. And, oh, it's the only form of coffee, caffeine, but sometimes they'd add a little button snake root to uh, seal the deal because the botanical name of Yapon Holly is Ilex Vomitorium. Okay. Ilex means holly. The other, you can figure it out yourself. <laughs> so they drink the black drink to purify their insides. So and that, Jerry carved that. He also made my necklace. He carved a lot of stuff. The, um, so, um, th this is another sash I made and all the plants mm -hmm. are grew in Missouri. So there's all the different kind of dyes you can get from local plants. Another thing I made was uh, for reenactors was powder horn straps. And I named my pieces. So and so I called this one Second Amendment. Now my daughter was playing the fool, so she said, Now Second Amendment, isn't that the uh, right to arm bears? <laughs> okay, I'll see your smart aleck answer, and I will raise you one. So I have little bears woven into the ends of my powder horn strap. <laughs> And yes, I shoot black powder. Jerry and I used to laugh as a running joke with us. Yes, we had to get married. No, I wasn't pregnant, but the man bought me my first muzzle loader. A guy does something like that for you, you gotta marry him. <laughs> this was a trade where um, we each thought we ripped the other one off. I'll pass this around. This man, he's a mail carrier in Illinois, Northern Illinois, engraved that. It's called a map horn because it's got a map all up and down the Mississippi. Look on the back, there's an eagle with a uh, sash in its talons with my name on it. And somebody had uh, a powder horn on Antiques Roadshow and engraved on it was the words, steal not this horn for fear of shame, for on it is the owner's name. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, let's see, okay. So I did powder horn straps. Well, I decided to try some more uh, things or, do, oh, I know. I was working all these uh, you know, historical events. Well, sometimes it gets cold. It's not all hot summertime. And if I wore a shawl, people say, oh, did you make that? No, it's not slim over. No, it's uh, this kind of, no, it's crocheted, no, it's knit. 
So they said, uh, so that, okay, I'm gonna have to make a shawl. And there was this, uh, Missouri Fiber Arts had a, uh, a uh, contest. No, I didn't make it for the contest because I was still spinning yarn. But the whole idea was, what was life like 2,000 years ago? I was like, ooh, ooh, I know, I know, I volunteer at Cahokia. So, 2,000 years ago, yes, they were finger weaving. And this is llama hair to here. This is alpaca to here. This is alpaca dyed with cochineal. Now, the cochineal bugs were something that the Aztecs taught the Spanish how to use as a bug, uh, as a dye. These are in the mealy bug family. And you know, like the mealy bugs that you sometimes get on your plant, house plants and you pour a little alcohol on them? These um, bugs live on nopal cactus. They're in the lac family. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Shelac. Shop. Shellac. <laughs> Shellac, yeah. Shellac. Yeah, you know how red that is? Well, it's um, when uh, the Spanish brought this stuff, because it, it grows on the nopal cactus, and it's, they're pregnant females, so they find their spot, and their legs fall off, because they're just, lay, the rest of their life, they're going to suck the juices off the cactus, <laughs> And they build this little foamy house over themselves, so they're set for life. Well, the Aztecs would scrape off the bugs, dry them in the sun, and in the old world, to get a bright red, sometimes called turkey red, you had something like 24 or 27 different steps you had to follow just to get the dye. I do the, I equate the uh, cochineal bugs to... Uh, the uh, Easter egg dye you get at the grocery store. You have the little pill, you throw it in the vinegar and water, and ta-da, you got dye. This stuff, you just crunch it up, you throw it in a dye pot, boom, bright red or purple, depending on what mineral salt you add to it. So, um, it makes this bright red that's very color fast. I mean, I looked it up, I did this in 2003, and I waggled it everywhere. This is, in, the, in North America, we used rabbit hair. All I could get was modern day Angora, which has been bred to have nice long hair. So I found some alpaca and Angora rabbit blended together. And this is bison hair on the top. So I have from South America to North America, the major fiber animals that were used. But by the way, I'm gonna put this up. If you guys wanna come and feel any of this stuff, look at it, I encourage you to, because bison is incredible. This one, I call this my impossible shawl because I realized after I just, well, you weave this way. After I wove just a little bit, it's like, okay, I want it to come down on my lower back a little bit further. So I need to make a bigger shawl. And by the way, there's no pattern on this. I just figured it out. Thank you, Daddy. And <laughs> <laughs> um, those of you who know my dad, I heard this story years ago. Grandma and Grandpa had a double lot, lot on First Street. Well, there's a house that they lived in for years that mom grew up in and they built themselves a brand new uh, pink granite house on the other side of the lot so they asked dad to tear down the old house and build a new one there for a rental house <clears throat> and my mother's mother you know lucille bunyard or lucille it was uh, talking to tom ream senior and said oh mr ream tom says he can build this house because he's never built a house before do you think he can do it well, i don't know would you think do you think he'd do it grandpa just said he can if he wants to. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> so, anyway, I wanted to make a wider shawl. And I was told, or I had read, I didn't believe any of this at the time, that um, you could only dye white wool. That's like saying you could only dye blonde hair. And that um, uh, natural dyes are all dull and earthy. I rest my case, and that um, you can't, uh, you can only weave little narrow things like hat bands or bracelets, and, uh, oh, you couldn't finger weave hand spun yarn. And the Mississippian people 2,000 years ago got their yarn from what factory? Mm -hmm. So aren't, neither Jerry nor I had any Indian blood that we can prove, but we can both prove ginormous hunks of German blood. We'll follow rules, but if you say, oh, you can't do that, just get out of the way and let us work. So armed with what we could not do, I'll show you the inside because I've wagged this thing around all over the place and I use this. 
and so it's a little brighter color on the inside. But Jerry dye gray wool with natural dyes. I spun it up and wove it into the 48 inch wide shawl because we were told we couldn't do it. So I have a nice little shawl to wrap up in. And I do, that's why it's kind of a little bit more faded on the outside because it has been through the mill. Um, now, we, now a lot of this is wool, but I'm talking, like I said, talking about the Mississippian people, they were prehistoric. So the, um, the first sheep weren't brought into this continent until 1493. Now, you think, well, what about bighorn sheep? They're really kind of a goat. So, um, true sheep weren't here till, weren't here for the Indians to use. So, what they used was um, bison and, thank you. If you look at bison in the spring, they look like they have mange. Or they look real ratty, like something's wrong with them. Well, they have this winter undercoat, and they blow it off all at once like a dog does. They shed it. So what you see that looks so ratty, it's not a skin disease. There's nothing wrong with them. It's their undercoat working its way through that outer covering. And uh, <laughs> twice I've had adults ask me, I said, I said, well, you, the Indians would pick up the shed, or nowadays they go wherever the Bison have scr you know, scratched against a rock or a fence post or something you know, after they move them to another pasture, you know, where they've scraped it off. And somebody said, why don't they shear them like they do sheep? It looks like it would be so much easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Try it. Yeah, a, yeah, a friend of mine said, can you say pate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I thought, I'm not a betting person, but there's times I watch sheep shearing. It's like, I put my money on that ram who just doesn't want to have anything to do with this today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... They use the bison here, and as you can see why, I'm going to throw this at you, Carol. Okay. All right, the outside, the blue is wool, but the brown is bison. So you can see how soft that is. And they also used rabbit hair. It's a rabbit pelt. <laughs> and another thing, you farmers are going to boo at me, stinging nettle. If you wait till the first killing frost... I saw one thing. Oh, you just used lineman's gloves. It's like, oh, yeah, they had lineman's gloves prehistorically. They were just, we find them in all the archaeological digs. But the, um, what you, somebody told me to do, said, you wait till the first killing frost, the leaves fall off, bye bye sting. Because that's where you're getting the sting from. Because the uh, stinging nettle has uh, microscopic little, uh, almost like little hypodermic needles in the leaves. And it'll inject you with formic acid, which is the same stuff that makes fire ants fire hurt you. But after you, after the leaves fall off, you have a stalk sticking there. And it has vast fibers that go the length of the stalk. And all you do is just break the wood out and, and you have all this bundle of fibers. It is structurally identical to flax that linen's made out of. And also I got to tell you about this. I was... I'll give it to you, Carol. I was in a, they had a gift shop in the, at the University of Missouri in the anthropology department, and this was on sale. It came from Nepal. It had stingy nettle on it. And I said, excuse me, but what's the price on this? Because they had a price tag, and I thought, okay, maybe somebody switched tags. And I said, $10. <laughs> so I threw my tenor down so quick and make your head spin. <laughs> and I walked out to the car waiting to hear alarms go off and stop the ether. <laughs> And this one is already sold. Oh, yeah. This is a sash, and a guy bought it from me. But this is, all my stuff is original designs, so uh, and I don't duplicate things. But this, whoop, whoop, the brown stuff is bison. But everything else is wool. And I started looking at other stuff they could have used, because I spin. And I was, uh, right after, we live uh, five miles outside of Salem. Right after we moved to Salem, uh, Jerry and I were working at Montauk State Park. And he was doing dye demonstrations, and I was spinning. And we had school groups come in. 
because it's a Friday and Saturday event, old mill days. And on Friday, or I was talking to the, one school group came up, and I, the guy who was in charge of it was a little bit of a flake. He said, I want you to have hands-on things for the children to do. And I said, okay, these mat materials cost money. Do I get any? Are you going to pay for materials? I could have heard crickets. No, he never answered that one. Well, I had a sheep fleece that I really didn't like. It was... Uh, the shearer was a beginner, so it had a lot of second cuts, which means think about a haircut and they like trim bangs. Oop, this is too long. Trim bangs. Yeah. They keep redoing it till the length is what they like. Well, for a spinner, having all these little short ends is not fun. To, but I had um, dog brushes, which they're a thing called hand cards that spinners use to brush the wool out. Mm -hmm. Hand cards, uh, they said, told me they'd gone up a lot now, but. They were 55 bucks a pair, so I didn't have enough money to uh, to supply an entire class. But I got dog br uh, wire dog brushes from Walmart. They were 250 each, so I was like, okay, I can afford that. So I had a bunch of dog fr brushes and a fleece laying there that the kids could brush, and I told them they could keep the wool that they carted out, and they're like, ooh, they, they thought that was really something. So that made everybody happy, and. Um, so I came up and I said, they had a little sheep in a pen or something over on the side. And I said, told the kids, I said, well, now what that is, that's hair off of a sheep, like that animal over there. But what I'm spinning is llama hair. And, said, and it was imported all the way from Patterson, Missouri. But I don't think you, I don't expect you kids to know where that is. The teacher says, I do, I'm from Piedmont. <laughs> so we're staring at each other, trying to get 40 years of age out of the way. <laughs> Finally, she said, I was a Christ. I said, gay? If any of you knew gay Christ, yeah, that's <laughs> Everett's oldest daughter. Yeah, that was gay. And uh, we were kind of talking. Around. I was telling the kids what I needed to tell them. And then Gay and I were talking about it, around it. And I said, well, we just told her where we just moved. I said, well, my sister-in-law lives there. We narrowed it down. I live on a dead end road with three families on it. Gay Christ's sister-in-law, sister and brother-in-law in the first house. <laughs> we Piedmont people get around. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, um, I was doing a color study just for my own giggles and grins. I want to see what a double lightning <clears throat> looked like as opposed to a flaming arrow. So I had the same amount of e each thread of each color on here. And the llama hair came from Culex. If you know yeah. Doug and Rosalie Culex, mm -hmm. it came from their place. Huh. I just want to play with it. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Other people have uh, creative hobbies. Now, which is the double lightning and which is the other? Okay, flaming arrow? Yeah, flaming arrow. Okay, the one that looks like an arrow with little, sh little <coughs> shoots coming out of okay. it? Okay. That's the flame. No, no, I took the wrong one. That's the flaming arrow. Okay. They're very close, because that's yeah. why I wanted to play with them and see which one ended up being more narrow or more. Yeah. Then I started making scarves. Oh. I'm supposed to demonstrate this. I have a spinning wheel that Dad made for Mama to be, okay, now that I'm a spinner, we call this a, let's see, S-W-S-O, spinning wheel shaped object. He made mama this pretty walnut spinning wheel to sit around in the room to look at, but it doesn't have the bobbins and the actual spinning mechanism. It just has the wheel that goes around and the pedal to crank it. And I'm gonna donate it here. So, uh, That'd be nice. and I, yeah. now daddy made me one that's functional, but you're not getting that one for a while. <laughs> Before, uh, the spinning wheel was invented in India. And the first one didn't get to England, yeah, back here, until 1450. And there's a whole lot of human history before 1450. Okay. Bison is really slick and short stapled. I think I got something better here. I thought I did. 
I packed it a long time ago. Well, it didn't end up in here. Well, we'll keep going with the bison. Anyway, um, there's a whole lot of human history before 1450. Nobody you ever heard about, just the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, everybody in the Bible. Nobody ever wrote books that you read, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But this is the tool that everybody used. Everybody's ancestors had to use this. Because all it is, this part is called the whorl, and the shaft. And you just need a weight here to act as a flywheel. And... Uh, So it's, uh, this is a primitive tool, but it's not a bad tool. I have <clears throat> a whole lot of spinning wheels at home that I won't, <laughs> we won't tell how many there are. I don't know how many spindles. The spindle, the quality of the yarn is just as good. It's just the spinning wheel is roughly four times faster because you don't have to stop and wind the yarn you just made on like I'm doing right now. Hmm. And the spinning wheel, it winds it around the bobbin automatically. So then I started having fun making scarves, mainly for myself, because I learned to knit socks. And if you make a scarf out of the same yarn that you that they <coughs> Sell so sock yarn in. You can have a scarf and socks that match. <laughs> if you're crazy enough to really want that sort of thing. That's just wool. And then I played with all kinds of other things. And it, most of them have some kind of little pin on them. Yeah. I, okay. It's a sneaky little trick I learned. If it's uh, a button with a little, uh, they have like a little, uh, I call it a cotter pin. Right. In the back. They hold it onto the button card. You use that, you just slide it through there. there so you, go. you didn't have to sew it. Mm -hmm. so. Here's one I made for Mama out of alpaca. And here's one. I think this is rabbit hair and silk. Okay, being a, spin, a weaver is kind of like being a woodworker. If you come across a different kind of wood, Oh, let's, let's work with that, see how it'll do. <clears throat> and these scarves were handy sometimes. As I said, I used to work at uh, City Corp in St. Louis. Well, it was quite a ways from the house. So maybe we had a Christmas party or something afterward. No. What is this one? Uh, some sort of acrylic, probably. Okay. It's, a, it's some sort of com commercial yarn. Oh, okay. okay. And this one was? I think it's rabbit hair rabbit. and silk. Oh, okay. But this one, I think it's some kind of man-made fiber. But it was handy. Mm -hmm. I had dress for work. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd have kind of a plain blouse. If we had a party afterward, I'd change my shoes to something fancier. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, where I worked at City Corp, it was, believe it or not, it was uh, full makeup and stocking seven days a week. Or six days a week. Mm -hmm. Until uh, Jerry got the job working at Dillard Mill, and it's like, I'm in the woods. I, I felt badly. One of uh, Sarah's little friends of Viburnum, when we moved to Viburnum, she said, she was trying to be nice, and she said, how are you handling the transition? What transition? <laughs> Moving here from St. Louis. That's why I laughed in her face. I said, I'm sorry, I said, honey, I'm from Piedmont. The transition was living in, up in St. Louis all those years. <laughs> this is almost home. A long time ago. <laughs> yeah. This is almost home. But anyway, when I had to be dressed up at work, if we had a like a Christmas party or something that night, I changed my earrings. I changed my shoes to something fancier. I put this over my blouse. Maybe changed my earrings. I was good to go. I was all dressed up for the party mm -hmm. without having to bring extra clothes with me. And you said this is just a man-made... Uh-huh. No, this is it's from the Sparkle Sheep. It's a rare breed. <laughs> oh, yes, 
because I've seen those before. Yeah, uh huh. Sure you have. How long does it take you to make them? It depends. I'm not trying to be cutesy. It's just uh, it depends on the pattern and how wide it is. Uh, if I can do six inches in an hour, I'm really smoking. So here's that's a nice muffler to keep my neck warm. Here's just decorative things to. This one I was at a fiber arts thing and uh, the. Uh, I was working on that first shawl. And they said, well, go ahead and put it in the competition. I said, it's not done. They said, put it in the competition. I had it in, in a basket. I said, have it dripping out of the basket. It'll look like something kind of artsy fartsy. Yeah. I didn't get anything. Okay, so, okay, I put it in the competition. I didn't have anything to work on. And everybody else was spinning, knitting, doing all sorts of things. So they had a vendor there, and I said, is that uh, wool in uh, two-yard hanks? And he said, yes. So... I borrowed scissors from somebody. I snipped a yarn neither end of the hank. They had a pin in the giveaway book, I mean, a, like an ink pen in the giveaway bag with a, just a straight ink pen. I'll show you in a minute. To st you start this by wrapping it around the stick to have something firm to start with. So I wrapped around the stick and I started weaving and this guy was watching the whole pr procedure and he says, that is the most low tech thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Then after uh, I got tired of making scarves, well, I still make scarves, but I decided to start making wall hangings. And this is, okay, my, my knot slipped. This little wall hanging, this is an arrow weave. Now in December, I gotta make my class model for that. It dawned on me <clears throat> that if you make, the, all right, when you weave your arrow, it goes this way. But dawned on me, if I make those suckers green and turn them upside down, I got Christmas trees. There you go. <laughs> so I made a Christmas tree ball hanging, and oh, you go. I made this one for my parents. We always like to go to Biloxi all the time. See, here's my trees, <laughs> and the starfish. Be careful, this is kind of delicate. These are dried starfish because they had a. Well, down at Biloxi, they have all sorts of shell shops. Right. So I got the shell shops, and I got the, the dyed shells and things. So I call that Biloxi Christmas. And uh, oh, here's another shell gorget that Jerry made. That's the... Uh, This is a wall hanging I made for my mother-in-law. If you made it for your mother-in-law, why do you have it? Because she passed away. Oh, that's right. <laughs> same, same reason I had the one that hang, the Bolesi Christmas that hang in mom and dad's house. That's uh, being historians, you won't you appreciate it as much as I did. My daughter has been uh, is mad at me because I'm keeping all this stuff that belonged to dead people. I was like, this is your history because she's got a little boy now. It's your history and Jack's history, but she didn't have anything, want to have anything to do with it. Aww. Now, on the other hand, I have a wonderful stepson who's married to a sweet lady in California, and they have twins. And Greg and Amber are both anthropology professors at University of California. <laughs> and uh, let's see, other things I made... I figured out, well, let's see the, okay, the wall hangings, all the stuff I'm showing, the wall hangings, the shawls and all that, I figured it out. It just, and I made, figured out how to make a purse. <laughs> now this one, okay, do not lose the contents of this purse. <laughs> because, like I have a Toyota Camry, this push button start, I lost the keys. And I've looked, I mean, we have torn the place up looking for it. So, okay, I got a six-point buck to about two years ago, two weeks ago oh. with my SUV. It's in a junkyard now. And so I had to, uh, I said, okay, these have to be programmed with the dealership. 
Okay, so the near, nearest deal, I live in Salem. The nearest dealership is in St. Roberts. So I called them, I said, okay, do you need the title or the VIN number? I said, no, you need to get the whole car up here. I said, I can't start it. I don't have, they said, we well, have to have a toad. Huh, thank goodness for AAA, that saved me $200. Mm -hmm. Which, this, they said, well, it's on back order. I said, uh, I'm here by myself. I rode up with a tow truck. He's gone. I live in Salem. They said, well, we'll work out. Well, what was on back order? These key fobs usually have a little regular real key in there. Mm -hmm. That was the part that's on back, because I'm up there by myself, and they said, well, we can't get a new one in until November 11th. <laughs> So where's, the, where's the top? <laughs> no, they. Shower. <laughs> I told somebody else they they got it. I said. If I said they said they're going to provide me with the car. If they don't, I'm going to go ransom a red chief all over them. If you haven't read that book by Old Henry, I su suggest you. <laughs> but this <clears throat> cost me five hundred and thirty dollars mm -hmm. just for the transponder. Mm -hmm. So I put it in here. Because I think that's what happened to it. It slip, It doesn't weigh anything. I think it slipped out of my pocket because the little key had a loop on it that you could put on a keychain. That part had broken off. Mm -hmm. So I was just sticking it in my pocket. And uh, especially women's jeans, they're, or ladies' pants, really have really nice. shallow pockets. Yeah. I think that's what happened to it. So Why don't you just keep that? We won't pass that one around. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll come and get you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what I'm going to hit? No, you won't. You can't get there. <laughs> <laughs> I can walk. My latest patch. Oh, also, make the little bookmarks. My stuff is kind of pricey because uh, somebody sent me a video that says uh, this costs so much because it, it takes bleeping hours. Yeah. <laughs> costs so much because I don't have superpowers. I brought that. I was going to put a scarf on her. We'll let you. Okay. <laughs> May I? Oh, that's a button. Here's a button. No, I've never dressed a mannequin. <laughs> My latest passion, a new thing to work on, has been uh, weaving beads into it, like the Osage Indians do. So I weave this, and I'm weaving the beads in at the same time. Lots of your shows, but I've, not right. lots of your shows, but I've, I've seen your things. Oh, yeah. Display. Yeah, I come to have. Like, Bill, Carol, looky, looky, this is what I've been doing. And here's the, uh, here's the other thing I was working on. So, uh, I have commissions that I gotta get done. This is for a, uh, because so, uh, a Creek gentleman in uh, Manhattan, Manhattan, New York, Manhattan, not Manhattan, Kansas. And this is a triple arrow. So I have to hold my mouth just right to do that one. And, oh. I was gonna say, how do you keep all that thread going without knotting it all up? I show you. It's funny you should ask, because I'm gonna show you right now. <laughs> Look at that wad. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you... You want me into your chair? I got it. You're throwing things on the floor. Yeah. That's why I wash them all and block them before I sell them because they get stepped on. Now, I use, when you finger weave, you need something to anchor your thread or tie it to. And 
What do I do with that work bag? I'm going to put it through this on here. If y'all want to come up behind me, I'll show you how it's done. Now, I could use any type of folding chair. I don't have to use a folding chair. I can just use anything that's going to stand still. Or you take a tie cord and tie this to a fence, a doorknob. I have a good time with that stair over there. I mean, there's just all kinds of things you can tie on to. I like to use this chair because, yeah, I got it in the 60s. What do you ask? Uh, <laughs> the, um, because the fiber on this, if it's a metal one, a lot of times what I'm weaving just slithers off into the floor because the metal's slick. And this kind of hangs on to it. So I can walk up and get away and get, get me something to eat or do whatever. But Joe, welcome to come up here and see me do a weave. Um, one thing nice about these arrow weave, uh, I want to do a two-tone. So if you make one half one color, the other half another color, it automatically swaps all the way down. I'm not doing a thing. It just does it. It's part of the part of the weave, function of the weave. And you say that the tangle, you just let it tangle and you pull out one thread at a time. Now this one's kind of, uh, threads are kind of long because this is for a big Shawnee fella. So it's supposed to be 18 feet long. Yeah, 18 feet, not inches. The longest one I ever made was for a fella named Rusty and if granny was, my granny was still alive, we would have said, Rusty had wintered well. He's a big boy. And he wanted a sash big enough to go around him twice, tie, and then the ends hang down. So we figured it had to be 14 feet. So the finished piece was 14 feet, 11 inches. And we have a picture of me somewhere standing a glorious five foot two in my moccasins with my hands stuck in the veneer like this. So the sash started there, up over the top of my hands and down on the other side. <laughs> so see, it's just an over and under all the way across. And uh, as I said, you wrap the yarn around a stick of some sort to start. This one, I had a little dowel rod in there and I, after you established a couple of inches of fabric, you don't need this stick anymore. This is uh, a carved, this is uh, a hairpin. Now, Jerry used to make a lot of them off of deer bones. It's a cannon bone between, on this part of the leg <coughs> of a deer, a white tail. But this is the same bone in an elk. And I think we have Mike Tony to thank for that one. I'm pretty sure we got from Mike. <coughs> He was going, doing one of those Colorado elk hunts, and we said, what do you do with the, the legs? And he said, huh? <laughs> we explained what we needed the legs for. I said, could we have them? He said, sure. You know Mike, how hard he is to get along with, not. So does anybody have any questions or do you anybody really care? Let me shut up so you can go home. <laughs> I gotta watch from this side. Okay. Little, so. Go right How do you know when to pull your thread through and which thread do you know to, to pull through to pull through? Uh at the risk of sound like a real smart aleck. I've been doing this for over 30 years. <laughs> so I know my pattern and I have it in my head. And some of the stuff I well, things like arrows and lightnings and flaming arrows and all that are uh, standard patterns among Indians. But um, I just know how it works. And I know that uh, 
when I want a border, and I, sometimes I've had double or triple borders. It's kind of like uh, matting a picture frame, picture. Sometimes you want a double or triple mat. You weave up to the edge of that color, and then you switch colors, and you you just she knows that's what you do. She just can't explain it really. <laughs> what? <laughs> Takes a lot of practice. Yeah, yeah I said I've been doing it for thirty years. And. Uh, your fingers get sore when you first start out. Not a bit, that. no. Okay. So this actually stays like this. Yeah. Is that right? It's got a, that slant is natural. That's what I tell people if you're taking classes from me. The slant is the nature of the beast. It's going to slant no matter what you do. And I don't care if you take forks or whatever and just pack it up and make it all square. As soon as you stop looking at it, it's going to slide back down because it's. See, I'm taking threads from here, but unlike a loom. Look at how show on my father's daughter. Okay, the on a loom, we have warp threads that go this way and weft threads that go back and forth in a shuttle. This kind of weaving, you only have the warps. The others have been weft out. <laughs> hey, I can't help my blood, birth, birthright, sorry. <laughs> we forgive you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Tom's daughter. <laughs> Or as I like to tell people, I'm my daddy's only son. Okay, now let's see. I remember. I assume when you first started doing these things, Susan. Yes. This didn't happen, right? I mean, right. I mean, mistakes happened, and oh yeah, then you have to rip them out and, and fix and, it. And, and you might have to come back on pretty good ways to fix yep. something. Or? I remember one time I had to rip out this much. Okay. And. Uh, I, some, I say some other things I learned from my daddy that he wouldn't admit to. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and how often do you use, how often do you make, would you make your own yarn using? All the time. Using this. Uh, uh, spindle? Spindle, yes. I mean, I tried that once with uh, Rebecca Privet. I think you oh, know yeah. Rebecca. Yeah, I met her. I think it took me about 20 minutes to do about a half an inch. Well, that's, it's one of those things that takes practice. It's a lot. Actually, this is very similar to, you know, if you tie uh, trout flies. Right? Uh -huh. You know, you're, you're up there, my mom talked, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, so you're using a piece of thread to... Yeah. To work the body of a to, to work the body well, of a creature. This is what I was looking for a minute ago. I cut so nice. Put this. This is uh, I'm making something for Robin Thompson. If you all know him, it's uh, Ed Thompson's nephew. I'm going to do with the spindle. We have another spindle. What? Oh, there it is. Under my hat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, no, it's wrong spindle. I think you filed it up here. It's up there. Yeah. Okay, be. It's got here little, it is. It's got no. little doodads around it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, it's got a technical term, but it's a doodad, hmm? as opposed to a thingamabob. Yeah. All right, the guy who made these put little beads around them and adds to the centripetal, centripetal force so it spins that much faster. But Robin has this uh, print that he really likes, and his wife is asking me to make a background for that print, and he wants it to, well, he, he went to school at MU, so he likes this color, and uh, the background is all going to be gray llama hair from Culex, because he wants to, anything he could have a, a local tie-in. But see, this I said, some parts of the world, the uh, spinning wheel never caught on because the people were nomadic. A few years ago, someone showed me a photo they'd taken in Bolivia where the ladies were spinning and uh, tending their alpaca herds. <clears throat> and you can walk around and spin at the same time. And I guess it takes some work to get these threads to the, to the, to the, the same thickness, is that correct? Yes, it was. Yeah, you know, practice, I mean, practice, practice. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much in 
short period of time. Well, come here. Tell them I tried it. It took me forever to get a couple of Here's my favorite part of the truck. Kind of watch it blow up in my face. Okay. Take both hands and try to break it. Yeah, it's pretty, well, I, I couldn't. Yeah. Okay, you got it. Okay. But it took you something. It took a little bit. Yeah. It took quite a bit of torque, yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, and then all you do is you fuzz it out. Fuzz it out on both ends. Now when I teach, I teach classes in uh, spindle spinning, and in three hours I can have you spinning and then plying, which means uh, you take two threads and twist them back the other, the other way to make a double thickness. I'm not doing a good job here because, but uh, in answer to your question, it kind of depends on where I'm at, because a spinning wheel takes up a lot of room. Sure. I know I got seven or eight of them at home, but. <laughs> But a spindle, okay, this isn't going to cooperate with me because <laughs> you're, you're watching me. Yeah. <laughs> um, a spindle doesn't take that much room. And you can throw, uh, years ago, they came out with this new spinning wheel that folded up. It was an expensive little rascal. But folded up and they said, well, this will fit in the overhead compartment of an airplane. I thought. And how many spindles and how much wool can I stick in the overhead compartment of an airplane? You know? mm -hmm. These don't take up as much room. Yeah. You're looking at me, it's broke. It's, <laughs> just, it's just not behaving. Yep, no, it's not. Now, on the uh, beaded arrow, Somebody told me, he said, well, it works better if you uh, string all your beads at once. I'm thinking, great. I don't want to string all these beads. He said, you ought to learn to put beads on here like the Osage do. And I said, I don't want to string all those beads. I think, oh gosh, that'd be so tedious. Until I learned some tricks from some people. Because I think that string of the beads, I was thinking about Taking the wool, spit, twist, 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 so it's real pointy, and then try to get a bead on it. Um, no. The trick that someone showed me was um, get my toys out of here. Is um, go to the Usually, CVS pharmacy. Yeah, somebody said, "Where do you get the KFC bead trays?" I said, "They're they're hard to get." KFC. Yeah. But I said, "Go to CVS and get these things called flossers." If you, I don't know if you can see it, it's a real thin nylon loop, and it's supposed to stick under your bridge work to try to get dental floss underneath there. But you can uh, stick a bunch of beads on here. And now these are size 8 beads, so it's got a big, little bit bigger than uh, regular seed beads, bigger holes. So, and so I don't knock the whole thing on the floor because I've done that before a lot. <laughs> I usually fill this up full of beads, and this works the same way as that good old metal, remember the little tiny metal needle threader you had in sewing boxes, it's like a metal yeah. handle on it, and a little tiny uh, wire, works the same way. You stick the beads through, the yarn through that loop. They're two for a dollar when you call them needle threaders, Susan? I think so. They're, they're five ninety five for one. When, when you when you call it a fly tying tool. Ah, that's it. But you see how quick I got three beads on there in just a set matter of seconds. And uh, well, there's a lot of things that. Uh, well, in the uh, spinning and weaving world, they had these things that they would sell. 
that uh, if you wanted to uh, count how you know, find out how much uh, yardage you have in yarn and a ball of yarn that you'd uh, run it through this mechanism and it'd count the yardage. And I forget how much those things were like fifty dollars or something. Somebody said I went to Bass Pro, Pro and got the same thing for fifteen. <laughs> Ooh, okay. <laughs> so a lot of times... There's, there's a time it worked in reverse. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes you work the other way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just move the beads up when I need them, and I got them all strung on here. Storage. Anybody have any questions? Cricket, cricket. I think I've asked mine already. Okay. I still don't understand how you do that. What? I still don't understand how you do that. Well, you can come up here and watch. That would do me no good. That's my head. <laughs> didn't, didn't you say Imagine, one time right? that someone told you, oh, you can't do that by hand? <laughs> you were. Yeah, my impossible shawl. I was told that. I had people say, oh, well, you can't finger weave something like that. And uh, I used to have a sign in my office at work that said, those who say it cannot be done should get out of the way of the people who are already doing it. <laughs> get out of the way of the people who are doing it. Uh huh. Amen. Yep. Well, there's a, a lot of things my dad did, and he found out later that uh, nobody had ever actually done that before, or hadn't. I don't know if you all remember uh, the Boy Scouts had this trailer they used for. Uh, Fireworks for their fireworks booth. What? That's back a while. They don't use it, do that anymore. When they sell fireworks. Uh, I don't think they sell. I remember fireworks. the trailer though. What? Yeah, I remember. Wait, that was our old camping trailer, and Dad made it in such a way he hadn't seen one before, but he got the idea of uh, the top went up and he sat on poles. And then there were boards that side, went out to the side that we could put uh, bed, mattresses on, beds on. Later they started making pop-up campers and said, hmm, I should have patented that. <laughs> so, um, now how long, like your, your shawl there, how, how many hours was this? The, the impossible shawl, I timed it, the weaving. And I didn't time the spinning. I should have done that, but I, uh, well, at the time I just picked yarn, picked fiber and decided to spin it up. And then later I picked the yarn up. So uh, the weaving was only 48 hours. Really? Mm -hmm. Of course I didn't do that 48 hours. I didn't do four days <laughs> continuous. <laughs> but yeah, it was 48 hours of weaving. Wow. That's really amazing. That is. Yeah. So, um, when I time things, I'll have to put a little scrap yarn on the side and I'll set a timer for 30 minutes. And I'll turn on the TV, I'll turn off all distractions, I'll be by myself, and I'll see what I can do in 30 minutes. And then measure it after 30 minutes and then extrapolate it into my rate per hour. Because somebody said, well, what you do is when you start weaving, you write down the time, and then when he's, I'm like, no, it's like boring. I do this while I'm watching TV. If I'm watching a baseball game. If it's the ball of the ninth and it's, I stop weaving. I'm staring at the TV. I'm not <laughs> doing any. Right? And, um, so I do this while I'm watching television. How do, much does one of those scarves cost? Well, I'll tell you what. Help yourself to look through that big basket, those are all for sale. And it depends on what I paid for the material. It's time and time and materials. Time. Right. This one is sure That's hand spun yarn, but I didn't spin it. The uh, the the indigenous dyes are they uh, are, are they supposed to as color fast as uh, as Commercial dyes? Every bit of it. Okay. Yeah. That's why uh, 
when the uh, Spanish brought the cochineal bugs back to the old world, they were like Bill Gates with Windows when it first came out. They had something that everybody wanted. And of course, the Spaniards made sure they paid through the nose. The Spanish made more money off the dead bugs than they did all the gold and silver they took back to the old world. And they took Whoa. boatloads full of that. Is that the same bug that they use for um, red uh, grapefruit juice? Yes. That's what I thought. Yes, Ocean Spray Ruby Bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. We're drinking bug juice. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and if you are in co cosmetics, especially lipstick, when yeah. it says carmine, yeah. Yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. Oh. Because see, it's natural. Right. Yeah. That's how they tag it as a natural yeah. ingredient. Uh huh. That nice it's also <laughs> it's also in the snowball cupcakes, the pink ones. Okay. Oh. It, it has it in those too. There's a whole bunch of there. Just pull yeah. them all out, Carol. Well, I'm just. Well, see, well, I okay, I had a, we had a thing called the Ozark Fiber Fling last Friday and Saturday in Steelville. And so I had, I had it all on display, so I pulled it all off my display rack and stuck it in that basket, and it was still in the back of the car, so what the heck, I just brought it anyway. <laughs> but those are all scarves. I don't have any, I do have some of those beaded straps in there. They're at the bottom. <laughs> no, uh, okay. <laughs> now, if you look at the tag, it'll tell you the fiber content on there because mm -hmm. it, it varies. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, I can't have that. I'm allergic to wool. I said, uh, you just picked that. The thing you just pointed out is acrylic. It's nylon. <laughs> Actually, I taught a finger weaving class in Rolla and uh, the student said, well, I can't use this yarn because I'm allergic to ac acrylic. I'm like, okay, I hadn't heard that one before, but <laughs> I thought, uh, well, this is a slam dunk because a lot of people are allergic to wool or different plant, fi or different animal fibers, but okay. And before you ask, I, I have used, spun up and woven with Yama, alpaca, yak, uh, guanaco, paca vicuña, uh, silk, stingy nettle, dog and cat. There was a, I was at a museum and the guy who was in charge of it said, have you brought me a bag of the cat hair that they combed out of the cats and said, can you do something with this? Yeah. And I took it as a challenge because I thought it was this nice way of saying, okay, smarty pants, okay. put your money where your mouth is. So I spun it up and I wove it into a wall hanging, kind of like that one I did, like nice. this one. I did a double lightning and I had, uh, they had buttons in the craft store that little cat faces down. So I wove the wall hanging out of that with the cat faces down it and I called it Kids Cats, entered it in the state fair and got a second place. <laughs> and Kit wanted to take one to keep the ribbon. I said, "No, you get the wall hanging. That's yours." <laughs> so you would use, for instance, if you were using rabbit, yeah, you're using. Are, are you using the hair towards the skin then, the, 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 or, or all the way, all the way out? Uh, that I don't know. Okay. I usually buy a. Well, people who raise bunnies, and I'll usually just buy a okay, bag of fur from them. Right. You know, a nice way to get fur is is uh, the fur companies. Uh-huh. Uh, this is something I learned from fly tying. You know, you go out and you buy something like this in a fly tying store and it's yeah. six bucks, right? You, you can get a hold of those uh, furriers in New York, and they'll send you bags for, for postage. Well, that's why I had, uh, in fact, but they broke up. But one of my cousins had a boyfriend who was uh, a fly tire, and he said, uh, what do you want to I guess you want mohair? Okay, it's white. I think it was mohair. Yeah. <clears throat> and he said, uh, he told me how he was paying per ounce of mohair. And I said, honey, I buy it by the pound. Yeah. yeah. But uh, how many pounds you want? I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll sell it to you at the price I paid for, which is. A, a piece of that rabbit pelt in a fly tying store, say this, uh, this big, uh -huh. is probably $7. 
gosh. I don't know what I paid for that. That was, uh, I bought it at uh, Cahokia Mounds, just to have an example of rabbit. And this is actually European hair. It's not a, it's not little bunny foo-foo. And I did, uh, I left that out. I wrote an article for um, <coughs> Illinois Antiquity because, okay, the, uh, in Mississippi Insights, they'd find these discs with a hole in the middle of it. You know, fire pottery disc with a hole in the middle. And I said, those are spindle whorls. I said, well, sometimes we find them with holes all the way across or something. Okay. My argument is, let's not try to come up with a one-size-fits-all answer to what these various discs are for. It's like saying, in our culture, a disc with a, with a hole in the center can't be used interchangeably as a truck tire or a donut. Mm -hmm. Same shape, mm -hmm. <laughs> different uses. So a friend of mine who was a potter gave me some uh, pot sherds. I mean, he made up the right prehistoric type pottery paste, gave it to me, poked a hole in it. Those some of guns spun like a champ. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about it, recycling is nothing new. Um, all right, these are, this is a culture that had pottery all over the place. We had busted up pots, so let's poke a hole in it and, you know, grind out the edges against a piece of sandstone to make it more or less round. You got a, a whirl to spin with. So, uh, you know, people are people. We do the same thing, just different, whatever means we have with us. Any other questions? Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Still don't know how you do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Our business name is Easily Amused Enterprises. Did that, does that answer your question? <laughs> easily Amused what? E easily Amused Enterprises. Because Jerry and I figured that we had to be easily amused to put in all the hours it takes to make these things. <laughs> We're not easily amused. Easily Amused what? Enterprises. Enterprises. Yeah. Have cookies, do you? Isn't it purple? What? Isn't it purple? It's pretty. Thank you. <laughs>